one. Hello, welcome to the CEC core curriculum module on evidence-based practice and research. I'm Lex Tartaglia. I'm an ACP certified educator who recently retired from Virginia Commonwealth University where I served as senior associate dean in the College of Health Professions after having been the medical center's director of pastoral care and the college's chair of patient counseling. This module will be brought to you in two parts. One as a PowerPoint presentation on evidence-based practice and research, and the other highlighting stories of how evidence-based practice and research were integrated into the work of some of your ACPE colleagues and friends. There are five of us who will be co-presenters. We will introduce ourselves as we tell our own stories. David, want to get us started? Sure, thanks Lex. Hi, my name is Reverend David Fleener. I'm the Director of Education for the Center for Spirituality and Health at Mount Sinai in New York City. My research journey began in my first unit of CPE in 1998. Um, I was a first unit student and I was sitting with the question that so many of us sit with in that first unit, which was, what in the world does a chaplain do? I mean, I remember my first week of CPE, my supervisors gave us a few days of orientation. They gave us our floor assignments and they said, off you go. And my peers and I just turned and looked at each other with this frightened look, what are we supposed to do? So of course, as I was asking this question, what, what do chaplains do and, and how am I supposed to do this? My, my supervisor and peers uh, would facilitate self-reflection and ask me what my answer was for that. And that was helpful to a degree. And one day I finally couldn't take it and I, I sort of sneaked off into the library and spent the afternoon instead of doing clinical time looking through the literature, trying to find out if anybody could tell me what chaplains do. And I did find some things. I found some things in the nursing literature that talked about collaboration with chaplains. I didn't really know how to synthesize any of this. I just uh, wrote down sort of cut and pasted quotes from each article and put together uh, a document that I eventually did share with my supervisor. And much to my surprise and my delight, he really valued this. And in fact, he said, can I keep this and do you mind if I share it with others? So I felt really affirmed in this first research endeavor, which I didn't even know it was research until years later when I was reflecting on this. And so in that case, I had a research question. I went to the literature. I put together a, a, a paper, if you'll call it, and then my supervisor disseminated it. And that was the earliest seed of research for me. If you fast forward, probably seven years later, I started supervisory education at a place in New York City where they, they were grant funded by the Templeton Foundation to increase research literacy for supervisory education students. So I was exposed to research courses. We learned about statistical software like SPSS. All along, my peers and I were kicking and screaming with resistance against all of this. Um, um, and yet it was still really helpful. I mean, our, our resistance was, this is not what the certification committee is gonna uh, evaluate us on. This is a waste of time. It's getting in the way of really becoming supervisors. And, and it turns out we were, we were right then and we, were, we are wrong now because as many of you know, the certification competencies have, have changed. And the reason for our work with you today is to um, make you more aware of the, the research certification competency. And then finally, about five and a half years ago, I came to my current workplace at Mount Sinai Health System, which is a, an institution that has a culture of research. And so it's just in the context. One of the first weeks on the job, I sat down with my new boss and she said, my expectation for you is two publications per year, which was a lot. And I thought, oh my gosh, how am I ever gonna do that? And I'm not even sure that I've actually achieved that goal uh, over, the, over the last five years, but I have I've been supported and had research mentors and writing mentors here within my context who have helped me develop my research skills and be able to publish a few articles uh, with the ultimate hope of advancing the field. To me, that's what, that's what this endeavor is all about. It's about improving our practice and advancing the field. So I'm really delighted to be on this journey uh, and delighted that you're on this journey too and really look forward to hearing my colleagues talk about their own journeys. 
Hello, I'm Beth Jackson Jordan. I'm a, an ACPE certified educator and uh, a director of spiritual care with Emory Spiritual Health in Decatur, Georgia. My interest in research literacy and research really has come as a result of many different um, curiosities over my years working as an educator. A few years ago, I found myself increasingly asking, why do we do what we do in CPE and as spiritual care clinicians? I wondered what evidence do we have that certain educational approaches are more effective than others? And then as I moved into leadership um, as a department head, I increasingly found that I needed to be able to report on how the work of spiritual care contributed to the quality outcomes of our hospital and our healthcare system. As our healthcare system at that time engaged the new expectations of the Affordable Care Act for quality and patient satisfaction, I had the opportunity to participate in interdisciplinary task groups to specifically address quality goals, such as patient length of stay and readmission rates. And I found that I needed to be able to use evidence-based care strategies for identifying the role of spiritual care clinicians in supporting these efforts. My growing interest in evidence-based care and research literacy really was a big part of my decision to begin a degree program to study adult learning and to learn about educational research methods. I chose to do my research on clergy burnout, which again came out of my direct experience and curiosity at working with so many clergy who came to CPE as a result of experiencing burnout. In doing this work, I learned that conducting research takes a tremendous amount of time and resources, and most of us as spiritual care clinicians and educators won't really become primary researchers. However, I'm committed, and I hope I can encourage you to be committed to using and teaching research literacy as a core skill for using best practices in our work as educators and as clinicians. A few years ago, I joined a group of colleagues to apply for one of the transforming chaplaincy grants funded by the John Templeton Foundation to plan and implement a research literacy program for our healthcare system. We created an interdisciplinary advisory group that consulted with us to continually improve our efforts to teach research literacy skills to people in CPE. This experience further convinced me of the necessity of research literacy for continually improving the quality of our work as spiritual care clinicians. Just this week, I had a, a delightful experience that helped confirm that once again, a resident who had initially been very resistant to our research literacy curriculum, that's not what I came into CPE for, has participated now for several months and she's been um, reporting on her work um, in telechaplaincy with COVID patients and brought a verbatim in which she had a whole half page of research uh, that she'd read on the long-term emotional impact of people suffering with COVID. And it had given her a whole new understanding and um, lens through which to view this important work she's been doing uh, to support and care for people with long-term hospitalization due to COVID. So I just uh, am convinced that now more than ever, we must work together as interdisciplinary team members to practice and teach evidence-based care to ensure the very best outcomes for the physical, the mental, and the spiritual health of all those in our care. Thank you. Um, my name is Chaba Silaji. I am the director for uh, spiritual care and chaplaincy at uh, Johns Hopkins Medicine, uh, Howard County General Hospital. I'm also an ACP certified educator and um, for a few years served on the ACP research uh, committee. Um, so a little bit about myself and my relationship and uh, uh, with research. Um, as, as many do, I started by reading and using research. And for me, the more I read research and sometimes I was forced to read research for um, various uh, coursework, uh, but 
more and more I read it, I realized um, and discovered uh, what value it has for me and for my work. I became fascinated with the insights as well as the ways in which people conduct research. I felt like a whole new world opened up uh, for me through research. And, and I realized that was the case for me because I love questions. I love asking questions um, and asking them from a multiple, asking them from multiple and different points of view and always kind of having that uh, devil's advocate op uh, uh, role where I am asking, how do we know what we know? Or how do we know what we think we know or what we assume that we know? And that is true for our patient work as we make a lot of assumptions about our patients or about our students. Uh, it is helpful and healthy to ask uh, uh, challenging questions and go about asking those questions in systemic and rigorous ways. So research was something that, that brought to me and, and helped me resonate with why uh, we need research uh, in our field. Um, it was like learning a new language. And, and the more I, again, the more I read and the more I spoke the language, uh, the more I felt confident in even uh, looking at what I would research, uh, which was uh, a question that, uh, that came up and, and really resonated with my curiosity and, uh, and my passions. And I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to have mentors who I could talk to about my interests, who um, felt like uh, entrusted me uh, with uh, doing some small projects or being part of projects. And, and that's the other part where I feel like um, research really uh, resonated with me is the collaborations. Uh, that I got to work with people I would have never worked with otherwise. I have uh, made friends through research, but more importantly, I have made partners. And partners, not just for research, but for our development, for our chaplaincy programs, our CP programs, uh, partners in understanding voices of patients that we didn't know much about. Um, so uh, the creative collaboration of research was very much something that uh, uh, really uh, captured my heart uh, in research. Um, and as Beth said as well, um, in our program, teaching about research uh, has a significant role. And as an educator, it's just a fascinating process to figure out how to teach about research and, and, and then accompany our students in that learning process. Um, and, and if you see students going from feeling shell-shocked or overwhelmed or disinterested in research to some of them getting excited about it, but most of them seeing uh, their personal and their professional uh, value uh, in uh, using research and integrating research into their clinical work. Um, and, and, and that uh, challenge for educators to, to help uh, students uh, leave our programs in ways where they feel empowered uh, to be part of the larger healthcare conversations, um, where they feel like they are equals of nurses and doctors and other health professionals in understanding and talking about the value of chaplaincy, to talking about the spirituality of their patients and how we can further uh, their understanding of those uh, dynamics. And um, so I'm happy to be here and hopefully this program will be something that also encourages you and help you move to a place where you see the benefits and the value of research and evidence-based practice. Hello, my name is Biba. I am the manager of spiritual care at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville in Florida. And before then I was uh, a chaplain at Mayo Clinic Rochester. My interest and my passion for research and evidence-based practice started when I was doing my second year of residency at the Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. Research was required in the journey, in my journey. And I knew that research was important, but it is only when I started using research findings in my clinical practice that I realized how important it was. It transformed my practice. My instructor back then, Diane Dodd McHugh, would take us to the library and ask the librarians to teach us how to search for uh, articles in the different search engines like PubMed. 
as a chaplain, that was very difficult for me. But gradually, I learned, I learned the process. And it just opened this whole, this wealth of uh, resources for me, because I realized that I needed to know what other people were thinking and doing in different settings. And so research became the springboard of my uh, clinical practice. I left VCU with a very curious mind, always asking questions where if I meet a, a, maybe a patient who is waiting for transplant, what are they going through? And what can I offer as spiritual care to this uh, patient? So when I left uh, VCU, I was hired as a chaplain at uh, Mayo Clinic Rochester. And there was a study, the Hear My Voice study going on there. This was a live review study with uh, advanced patients with advanced cancer. And they were offering a spiritual legacy document. And through this study, they realized that spiritual well-being, emotional well-being, and religious coping improved. I was very intrigued because I was one of the chaplains who would interview, interview these patients. And I was nervous before, but I realized that there is something that chaplaincy brings into research. The, our continuous reflective practice and always wanting to say, we were doing this before, how can we do this better? So I used the questions that we used in that research to start uh, working on my patients in different, in different units. And I realized that just asking them those questions expanded my, the conversations opened up, made the patients to open up. So research helps us to be able to improve on our, on our practice. So because I was involved in this practice, I had some experience with what cancer patients were going through in the tra tra trajectory of their treatment from when they were diagnosed, how anxious they are, and to when maybe they go into, their cancer goes to remission. Because of that, um, I engaged some physicians recently in a conversation because they shared with me that in their clinic, they see a lot of emotional distress and patients ask them questions that they cannot answer. So because we were having that conversation and I had this experience working with cancer patients, I was able to provide them with insights about spiritual distress. And they became very interested. And right now, I am developing a study with the, the uh, patients who are undergoing gynecological surgeries and the kind of spiritual care interventions that we can offer. But it's because of that background of having worked with research and with cancer patients that I was able to bring in these insights. After my two years of being at Mayo Clinic, I was um, privileged to become one of the 16 transforming chaplaincy um, fellows. So I went back to school and did a master's in public health. And this again opened up new doors for me because we are saying that chaplains are found in these um, evidence-based institutions so that that culture is already there and we need to speak the language. And for me, I say, yes, we speak that language, but we do not forget our own language. And that's how I engage with the physicians that I'm talking with. I'm able to speak the language that they can understand, but I'm also able to bring in the spiritual care insights as well. So my uh, master's in public health opened up for me different ways of doing research, methods and methodology, which were two things that I could not understand before. So recently, after we finished that program, I was also asked or tasked to teach the research literacy um, course for chaplains, because we are saying research is important and not all chaplains will be able to do research. But the most important thing is that chaplains become research literate. So these courses are taught to chaplains now to help them to be able to read, to be able to find research, and to be able to use that to apply to their clinical practice. And one of the things that I keep on thinking about from the study, one study that we did when I was a resident at VCU, we were tasked to do a study on organizational culture. And I still use the results of that study today because I came to realize through that study that all the, the units in the hospital are not the same. 
the acuity and maybe in the emergency room or in the ICU, the complexity of the patients who come into that space is different. And so the kind of spirit, the way we approach them would be different and the kind of spiritual care that we bring to them would be different. So now when I come into the hospital and maybe I'm working with patients in the ICU, in my mind, I know that this is a kind of care that I can bring to this population of patients. So knowing your setting, knowing the patient population are important guidelines and things that research has taught me that you need to put into consideration to be able to care for, for patients. So I am intrigued that I'm part of this process and hopefully this will add to our journey as chaplains. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, sharing your own stories. I think two things that really kind of stand out. One is that uh, in different ways, each of you took advantage of opportunities that came your way um, and, uh, and, and sort of found ways of connecting. And, and that's the other thing is that to be successful um, uh, in, in being involved in research or evidence-based practice, you had to find partners um, to, to move ahead because um, clearly, it, you know, these are complex issues that no person individually can take on themselves. I think my story is, is somewhat similar in that um, I, it, I sort of evolved um, through three different avenues and that came about through asking three different kinds of questions. Um, uh, you know, one, set of, one question I often ask, you know, when I think about research is what am I curious about? What do I wanna know? What can I do different than I'm doing now? Um, the other is who is involved in, um, in research um, or practice that shares common interests that I have? Um, you know, who, who are potential partners? And the third, um, how could I as a chaplain contribute to the priorities, not only of what, not only thinking about what chaplains do, but how can I add, uh, contribute to the priorities of the organization that I serve? Um, so those are questions that I came about. And so I've got some examples of each of those. The first question being about curiosity. So I was probably, um, I first got certified in 1981 and um, was, was doing CPE for probably 10 years and sort of was really kind of getting bored with verbatims the way we did them all the time. So I sort of, how can I put some, some life into the verbatim, number one? And then number two, are there alternative ways of um, looking at students' clinical practice without verbatim, you know, other than verbatims? Well, the verbatim part was kind of interesting. One of the things that I did was also related to, you know, there's so much we could teach in a unit of CPE. How do we begin to think about what to teach and what's going to be relevant to students at, at any particular point in time. So what I did was um, assign, ask students for every verbatim that they, uh, that they presented, I sent them to the library and they had to come up with, they had to find a research article that was related to the care of the patient or the family um, that was being presented in the verbatim. Um, they then took that article, shared it with uh, their peers before the, uh, before the verbatim was presented, um, and then used it in the analysis. Um, and then one of the things that they did was look at, okay, if I, knew, if, I, if I know now, if I knew then what I know now about how to care for these patients better, um, what would I have done differently and put that into the analysis? And, and you know, I think you know, Biba's comment about culture being different in units, um, you know, the kind of care we deliver to different kind of patients is different as well. Um, you know, there are some common components that we do with patients of uh, life limiting illness, but what I might do with a patient with COPD, uh, they might have different challenges um, uh, or needs than a patient who's undergoing a bone marrow transplant, for example. So, so looking at those kind of unique differences was, I think, important. Um, the other is I got tired of reading verbatim. So I, looking at alternative ways, and I've told this story before, um, and that is that I started using standardized patients to evaluate um, um, student ministry. 
um, and, and looked at ways in which we could actually measure a change from the beginning to the end of an initial unit of CPE, looking at the different kinds of responses that students were doing and the way that they responded in certain situations. A simple example being, you know, was a student able to move from using closed-ended questions at the beginning of a unit to using more open-ended questions or avoiding feelings in the beginning of a unit to exploring feelings further with a patient in the end of the unit. So, uh, so some of the, those are some of the things that I was curious about. Um, the other um, the other thing is, the second question is um, similar interests. Um, the first grant that I was on was a National Institute of Mental Health grant. I was approached by the faculty in our Department of Psychiatry when I was at University of Rochester Medical Center in New York. Um, and they were filing, a, they were submitting a grant to look, at, and this was back in the late 80s, um, to look at how they could train healthcare providers um, and influence the attitudes and behaviors that they had towards patients who, were, who had HIV or AIDS. And so they approached me about, you know, could we train your chap, I was the director at the time, could we train your chaplains and your, um, um, and your students? And I said, sure. I said, but, you know, I, I want something in return. And the answer was, what's that? And I said, well, you know, who's, who's teaching the folks about spiritual care for that patient population? And do you have somebody like that on your grant? Well, the answer was no. So I said, well, how about putting me on the grant? You can have exposure on my students. So that was sort of how I negotiated that first, being part of that first grant. And that actually led to my development of a published spiritual assessment tool that um, um, evolved into the spiritual assessment document that we used in, here in Richmond. Uh, another example um, of you know, common interest, and, uh, and Beth, uh, Beth was part of one of these particular studies. I, I sat on a number of APC certification committees, and then a number of you know, candidates come by, came along with excellent um, interviewing skills. But when you ask them to articulate a framework by which they did a spiritual assessment, and you know, some, some candidates were, you know, uh, had gotten their first job in a hospital and were asked to serve on an ethics committee. And I asked them, you know, what's the, uh, you know, theoretical framework by which you would articulate and analyze um, an ethical dilemma. It was, I got these blank looks and started thinking, well, you know, how is ACPE doing in terms of uh, uh, teaching spiritual assessment and, you know, teaching to the APC competencies because for most residency programs, most students are going on for APC certification. So we did a couple of studies. I think was involved in two studies. One on looking at, um, uh, you know, how spiritual care documentation was taught, and the other um, looking at um, spiritual care documentation, and the other looking at APC competency. So. Um, uh, so those were kind of finding partners that were interested in those kind of questions. Um, the last one, the third question I had was uh, around organizational priorities. Um, and in, in the PowerPoint presentation, you're going to see we're going to be talking about both, um, both evidence-based practice. We're going to be talking about evidence-based practice research and how some of those evolve from uh, performance improvement. Uh, in the late 1990s, our hospital was interested in increasing organ donation rates. And I became part of a task force that led to the development of a protocol and policy that committed chaplains to the care of families of potential organ donors. Um, we were the only ones of a, about a dozen centers across the country that, went, that took part in this national initiative that used only chaplains to care for patients. And with the task of caring for families and advocating for enhanced communication with them, uh, the project not only increased donation rates, but demonstrated decreased stress for nurses uh, who cared for those patients. Uh, this led to a multi-center federal grant um, um, worth almost a million dollars and a half dozen publications. So again, this was just sort of taking advantage of an opportunity that, uh, that was put before me. Um, so with that, um, I, you know, we've, everybody's heard each other's stories. I'll invite 
any of my colleagues to see if they have any comments or other observations. I just also want to note that we wouldn't be here together today if it were not for research, as we uh, started finding each other and working with each other at different projects, and most recently the exploring the impact of uh, COVID-19 or CP, speech or education, which is also a good example of uh, that we think we know a lot and we have experienced a lot of changes, uh, but then expanding that conversation and looking at how those trends and what they look like uh, in our larger professional community. And, and just wanna kind of underscore again, these kind of ways of asking questions as well as developing relationships across the, the along the way uh, with each other. Looks like Beth's trying to jump in, but she- Beth, you're, you're trying to jump in on me. Thank you. Um, I would just add, to encourage folks watching this to not be intimidated by the stories of those who have done a lot of research and uh, you know, accomplished getting grants and publishing. Um, some of you will go on to do that. You'll get hooked into the love of research. Many of you will just be research literate and be able to plan and implement curriculums that include maybe yourself, but maybe just bringing in others who have that expertise to teach your learners and um, ensure that they're research literate by the time they finish um, their CPE journey. So um, we're at all different levels and that's one of the things I've enjoyed about every research team I've been on or every work team related to research literacy is I learn from everyone else and I'm always continually improving my own skills and my own um, understanding of of how this all works in terms of going back to what we do as spiritual care clinicians and providers. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Beth. And even though some of us have done some research and had some publications, there's, you know, we didn't start out to do that. Um, you know, you know um, I think it, it, it just evolved over time. And I really want to emphasize on this point of partnership and collaboration and encouraging chaplains to reach out because many other disciplines are doing research on spirituality and spiritual care. So when we reach out, maybe asking, could we add a spiritual care question to, to your study? It's, it really helps. And so just reaching out has helped me a lot at Mayo Clinic, reaching out to the physicians, and now I'm partnering with them to do research. So that's very important. And then people can also invite you as well. I was recently invited to um, be part of a, a study about uh, spiritual care during COVID-19 with uh, ERIC, the European Research Institute for Healthcare Chaplains. So that's just amazing. So we reach out and then we get these invitations to participate in research. Such an excellent point. It's such, it's such a great way to learn how to do research, no matter what level of ability you have is partnering with others. And so uh, mentoring can take place, just simple observation and picking up small things, like how do they ask questions? How do they answer these questions? And what small part, if any, can I play in that? Uh, in terms of the publication and, and all of that. So I, I really uh, would second that point. And also want to just build on something that Lex said about the questions, the, the curiosities that we have about CPE in our practice. Um, a couple of studies that I've been involved with have been around really one central question. What are my colleagues doing? And so did a survey about journal clubs, surveyed CPE residency programs, are you guys doing journal clubs? How do you do them? What do they look like? How long are they? Who leads them? Uh, also did one around ethics education and CPE residencies. Do you teach ethics? Who teaches it? How do you teach it? How much of it do you teach? You know, it's all these questions because ultimately I want to have a really strong residency program at Mount Sinai and um, want to work with my colleagues to figure out what are you guys doing and what are some of the best practices and what might my curiosities be able to, uh, uh, to teach uh, my colleagues. And David, one of the things that you mentioned earlier was the importance of, you know, 
working with your, well, your administrator was on you to do it, but working with administration um, uh, to support these kinds of activities. Yeah, I mean, the context or the culture of the organization is so important. I've, I've been in other organizations where chaplains involvement in research was not a priority. And it's really hard in those contexts to be able to allocate some of your time and your energy towards that. So I'm fortunate, like some of you, to be in a context now where my administrator, the, the culture of this organization highly values, even to the point of, of requiring involvement in research. And I, and I certainly welcome that, you know, that's just because of my enjoyment of research. But I wanna underscore how important the culture and the context in which we work is for supporting this work. I want to highlight that, David, I think it's Mount Sinai that has done some significant studies around the connection between chaplain visits and patient satisfaction outcomes. And I know I have used that, cited that, passed that on to people in my um, areas of work. So that great example of the benefit of that being encouraged and even financially supported in your institution. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that study preceded me, but it really helped us in our own local context to advocate for more financial support for chaplains. And, and then by publishing it, you know, others have been able to use it for the same purpose. And I, I think that's a great example of how beneficial uh, this you know, research can be for all of us. And at the same time, I would like to add as well that if it's not requirement or it's not part of the organizational DNA at your place of work, but you have a question that you're really interested about, um, there are multiple ways of finding partners at your organization or outside of your organization who might have different pieces of the puzzle. And, and I just want to encourage you to, to articulate how that aligns with your job and make room for it because sometimes you may find more room than you, than you thought you have, as well as if you may have the question and somebody may have the methodology to do that. So again, um, follow your heart in terms of, of seeking out people who can help you do what you wanna do in your uh, center. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's great, Shai. Uh, you know, and you know, we're gonna be um, sharing some in the PowerPoint presentation that you're going to get to see, we're going to be sharing with you some resources that are external, that are going to be external to your organization that you might be able to call on to support or guide you in uh, a direction that you might be headed. Um, and the other thing I would think about, you know, I was thinking about David and administration, um, it, to, you know, to not just think about um, spiritual care or pastoral care journals when you're thinking about research, but look at what's uh, what's in other journals. Uh, so, you know, the, the one of the articles that we, you know, that we did on nursing stress on uh, our protocol on nursing stress was in the Journal of Nursing Administration. And a lot of people, you know, um, report to, you know, a VP for health uh, health services, and uh, often that person um, uh, may also also be the chief nursing officer or somebody um, of that of that level in your organization. So, um, so think about other other places where research um, around spiritual care and pastoral care could be uh, you might you might find helpful, and that you might share with others. Any last comments or um, do we wanna wrap this up? Everybody okay? Well, um, we hope that you uh, appreciated, uh, you know, this, uh, our stories. Um, we look forward, you, we look forward to seeing you back um, when, we, when you uh, view the PowerPoint. Uh, best wishes to y'all.